Marlene, you want to give us your name, uh, your maiden name, and uh, your date of birth and where you were born? Okay, my name is uh, Marlene May Silas Weisrock. Uh, Weisrock is spelled W E I S R O C K. And I was born in Oneida. All right, uh, would you give us uh, uh, the names of your parents? My father's name was uh, Dewey John Silas, and my mother was May Jordan. All right. Uh, did you have any remembrance of your grandparents? Oh, sure. I remember my grandma got hit. Um, okay, and on which side? And that was on my up? father's side, and uh, her name is um, uh, was Mary Silas. Um, Mary Johnson, I think, is what her name was when she passed away. But um, I remember my grandma. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, um, the very last memory I have of her is um, calling my father and asking him to bring um, myself and my two younger sisters up to Oneida. We were living in Milwaukee at the time because she wanted some pictures taken with us. And um, we came up and he brought the camera and we had our pictures taken around her sitting in a wheelchair. And the following week she passed away. And I remember, you know, I remember that vividly. But um, I remember my grandmother too, um, always baking and I could smell that bread and, and pie she used to make. and. Um, You know, when when you look at that old cook stove, you know that they used to put the wood in, and uh, and how and how that stuff would come out so wonderful. It was just amazing that, you know. Do but, you remember your grandmother's background at all? Uh, uh, did you ever talk to her about her education? My grandmother never uh, went to school. Um, my father, she and my father, I think, only went to eighth grade. Um, but um, what was your father's name? Dewey. Dewey, Dewey John Silas. And uh, uh, but my father, he, even though he didn't have a, you know, a very good education, he could do anything. He could build anything, or he could fix anything. He was just that type of guy, you know. If he wanted to, whatever he wanted to do, he did. You know, he was just that. You know, some guys can just, you know, drive a truck. Uh, you know, fix a car, you know, build a house. He could do anything. He was just one of those kind of guys, you know. And, uh, and I remember my grandma, too. She was always, you know, in the woods picking herbs and stuff, and she would give us this medicine. And, oh, it used to taste terrible. But, you know, as a child, I can never remember being sick, you know, whatever it was, you know, she used to give us. We never was sick. I remember one time my dad was really ill. He was laying in bed and he had um, a bad cold or something. And I remember her going out in the woods and bringing back a bunch of stuff. And and it was like um, those old dish towels they used to use, those like linen or, or muslin, you know, type. And she put all of that stuff in there and then she sewed it all the way around and put it in and boiled it, you know, and she would take it out of there and put it on my dad's chest and then take it out and, you know, and pretty soon my dad was okay again, you know, but that's why I remember my grandma always, you know. Where, where did they reside? Um, my grandma um, on my dad's side, Gun Hit, she lived over by Chicago Corners, what we call Chicago Corners. Um, I think that's called um, Fish Creek Road, you know. But I can remember that road, it never was, you know, I can remember coming down that road and it was all gravel and in the springtime and, uh, you were driving down there. If you had the windows open in the car, I'm telling you, you were dust from, you know, top of your head to your shoes. Now, this was on your uh, my father's, father's side. side. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything on your... No, room? my grandma um, on my mother's side was already gone when I was born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, then let's go back to your grandma gun hit and uh, mm -hmm. did did uh, they speak Oneida? Always, I don't remember them ever speaking English. They um, all spoke um, Oneida at home, and uh, you know I can't ever you know. Um, 
I don't remember them ever speaking English. Did they attend any of the local churches? Yes. Um, well, my mother went to the Methodist church. I don't remember my father ever going to church, you know. But uh, Were they involved in any of the uh, uh, tribal doings of any, any sort at all that you can recall, going to any meetings or anything like that? No, but I remember my mother... Um, um, telling me that my, both my mother and my grandmother, um, well, my grandmother um, really was like a midwife up here. She delivered a lot of babies. She delivered me, my sisters and brothers. Um, but I don't remember, I, I don't recall them ever, you know, uh, attending, you know, um, any kind of... Uh, programs or anything, you know. Uh, I don't think there was that many at that time. Uh, but I do remember that they had a like a scarlet fever or some kind of an epidemic up here. And my mother told me that people were dying, you know, left and right up. Um, and all my mother and my grandma would do was go from house to house and uh, wash up all the dead people and get them ready for burial and then go to the next house and do the same thing, you know. Um, washed your hair and get them all ready. And uh, my mother said that uh, they never got sick and they never brought the sickness home. So whatever she, my grandma gave them, you know, protected them. Okay, let's talk about your mom and dad a little bit. Okay. Um, tell me what your dad, what was your dad's occupation? Well, when we were in Oneida, my dad did a lot of uh, farming and tending bar for Johnny Vandenberg and working, you know, different things. Um, uh, it was hard. And then he was, he worked up in the, um, uh, in the woods. And I remember um, him telling us a story one time that um, um, they worked right up until the snow started coming in. Um, everybody was getting out of the woods now and they still had a team of horses that had to be driven back to Oneida, and and uh, he told uh, them, well, me and my brother-in-law will drive them back, and that was my Uncle Vincent Wheelock, and my uncle said, oh, I was so mad when he volunteered us to drive that team back, and he said it was just really a rough road, you know, because they were coming back from, like, Stockbridge Reservation they were working, and they had to drive the team all the way back to Oneida. But... Um, yeah, he did. He worked in the woods, and then um, we would go back and forth to Milwaukee. He, one time we got to Milwaukee, then he couldn't get a job there, and he went to Chicago, and we were in Milwaukee, and some of my sister, my sister, and I think, and my brother were still up in Oneida, and um, then uh, he couldn't. He would work in in Chicago, then he'd take that North Shore back to Milwaukee on Friday, and. Then on Sunday, we'd put him back on a train, and he'd go back to Chicago. Well, finally, it was, um, I think it was in the 50s, my dad got a job at, um, what was it? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was in the 40s. My dad got a job at Alice Chalmers in Milwaukee as a crane operator. And he uh, ended up spending uh, 30 years there. And uh, so that kind of made our, you know, our life a little bit better. We didn't have to you know, the transit Indians back and forth to the reservation. We got a, I my dad. I and, and cut okay. you off just a bit. Of, that mic keeps slipping in. Oh, we're rolling again. We're talking about uh, your dad uh, yeah. went to work down in Milwaukee. At Alice Chalmers, yeah. He ended up there for 30 years before he retired, and then he bought what us. Would, what, what year was that that he started? Jeez, I don't know. I think it was in the late 40s. Okay. All you right. know. Mm -hmm. now, uh, do you remember uh, your dad... Uh, his education? He he had a very limited education. I think eighth grade. Yeah, okay. you know, okay. if if that, you mm -hmm. know. Um, uh, and uh, what about your mother? Uh, what what education background did she have? Well, did you ever talk about it? Yeah, my mother my mother had a kind of a rough life. She was um, um, sent to to boarding school, and um, she ended up in Carlisle. Um, and um, in the summertime, she would work for rich people in Pennsylvania. And uh, I think that's where she got all her uh, um, 
I always called them such an odd um, taste because uh, she liked oysters and clams and lobster and, uh, um, you know, she liked all these real expensive foods. We never had that kind of food at home, you know. Couldn't understand where she <laughs> she got all this expensive uh, uh, taste from, but uh, that was from working for people when she was a young girl in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, she had a lot of good stories about uh, uh, being in Carlisle. She made a lot of good friends. And she kind of was telling us how they got their names. Like, she she was really good friends with this one girl named um, uh, Lucy. And I guess Lucy's name was Lucy Runs Close to the Lodge. And when they got up there, they said, what's your name? And she said, Lucy Runs Close to the Lodge. And they said, well, from now on, your name is Lucy Lodge. And that's how they changed their names, you know. And she told us that... Um, um, they were forbidden to speak their language then from that day forward, and um, they had taken, she said they had um, um, uh, clothes like the white people wore when they went to Carlisle, but some of the Indians from the other reservations out west, when they came in, they would still have, you know, Indian um, garb on. And um, she said they made them put on uh, dresses and pinafores, you know, like aprons over them. And uh, they all, you know, were dressed basically the same. The boys were the same way. They had shirts and, you know, trousers. But she said, um, the Navajos especially, she said they had, uh, uh, in the woods, they would, uh, they had a drum. And they would have, hold their ceremonies. And um, the Oneidas would all get together. They all spoke their own languages that, you know, no matter what they did out there at Carlisle, they could never break them of, of um any of their, you know, traditions. There was a naming ceremony. The Sioux would hold their namings, the, the Navajos, or whatever, you know, right uh, passage to, they would come into. They would still hold them no matter what. So that was kind of interesting for me to... Um, several years ago, I was out in um, Inn of the Mountain Gods in um, uh, Rio Rubidoso, uh, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was there, they had um, um, somebody from the Smithsonian, I think, was out there. And they had this um, book on Carlisle. And I told that lady, I said, my mother went to Carlisle. And in that book was my mother's name and a picture of her in a, like in a, you know, in a sewing room or something. You know? So that was real interesting for me to, to see that they had, you know, pictures of the kids from school. When, uh, uh, well, what year did your mother and dad get married? Do you remember? I think it was 1920. 1920? Mm hmm And how many children were there? Nine. Nine? Mm hmm Can you give us their names? Sure. The oldest one was Varila. Um, do you want to know who they married to? or? If you want to. Okay. Well, Varila married uh, Malphia Smith. Okay. They had 14 kids. And then uh, I had a sister, Beatrice, and she married Roland Hill, and they had 12 children. Then I had a brother named John, and he was married several times, and I, he ended up with about 12 kids. Um, and then I have um, a sister, Catherine. She married a fellow in Milwaukee called um, Sylvester Lewandowski, and they had three children. And then my brother, uh, Eugene, he married an Irish girl, and they had two children, and then he married Beverly John, and they had two children. And then um, I have my brother uh, Dewey, who's um, the priest up here, and he um, um, has uh, two children, three children. And he's married to a, a Marlene Schuyler, and um, that's why I can't take my maiden name back, because uh, uh, he married a Marlene. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's me, and I was married twice, and I have uh, three children. And then I have a uh, sister, Patsy, who married George Thompson. They have five children. And a sister, Sandy, who married uh, John Reisner, and they live in Indiana, and she has um, three children. Oh, that's a big family. That's a big family. Do you ever all get together? 
Yes, um, um, we try to get together around the 4th of July, you know, uh, when they have the uh, powwow up here, then everybody kind of, you know, comes around. Uh, um, or, you know, like my brother's getting installed as the bishop, then a lot of the family members will come, you know, for that, you know, at the end of this month. Now, where, where were you... Uh primarily brought up then? In, uh... um, well, my younger years were spent here, but basically Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, 19, 1980, I think it was 1980, my mother had a bad stroke in Milwaukee. And um, the nursing home up here had just opened up. It was, you know, it wasn't open too long. And um, my sister decided that Maybe my mother should come up here because the doctors told us that she would only live maybe a month or so. Um, she had like fluid on the brain and she had a bad stroke and she'd never, you know, they didn't think she would make it more than a month or so and they had to get her out of the hospital in Milwaukee so we brought her up here. That was in 1980, I think it was in 1981, something like that. Anyway, my mother ended up living uh, to, to be uh, 91. She ended up living in the Oneida Nursing Home for you know, um, about 10 years. And uh, so in those 10 years, if I couldn't come up every week, I would be every other week. But, you know, so basically for the last, you know, since 1980, I've been, you know, up here. I didn't move back up here until my uncle got, my aunt um, and uncle both were ill and they have no children. I was closest to my uncle, my aunt. And that was uh, Vincent Wheelock and Josephine. And Josephine had gotten cancer, so um, she would have, her family would come and watch her during the week. And then on weekends, I would come up and um, take care of her. And then her family would come back on Monday and stay the rest of the week with her. Anyway, um, when she passed away, well, then I, uh, there was nobody to take care of my uncle, so I ended up coming back home. And... I was born in the same house where my uncle lived, you know. That was my mother's, um, my grandma's house. Where is that located now? Uh, it's right on um, E, right next door to Orville, Orville Webster. I live right next door to Orville Webster on okay. E, right by Bain Road. Just past Tips there? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm right back where I started from. I was mm -hmm. born in that house, and then, you know, then um, I ended up being back there. And it was real strange because I was sleeping upstairs in the same bed. I, you know, I think it was the same bed <laughs> that I slept on when I was a little girl, and um, uh, it was the same. We had no, there was no electricity up there when I moved. And this was in the eighties, or yeah, no, nineties. This was nineteen ninety when I moved. I had to move back up here to stay with my uncle. And it was the same way as when I was a kid. I mean, the, everything in it, except it was fresh paint. But uh, I hope they change your mattress between then. Uh, and then. I I don't know. It still felt like the lumpy old thing that I. <laughs> but well, anyway, I was. Let's, uh, let's go back to uh, uh, where did you start school then? Um, I think I was at Chicago Corners for you know, uh, kindergarten, and then we went to Milwaukee. I think it was kindergarten or first grade, it was Chicago Corners. And then um, and then to Milwaukee. I just remember my surf pail. That was my lunch bucket. One of those big Carroll uh, cans of surf. Well, that was my lunch pail. But that's all I remember. You know, I can just remember, you know, little bits and pieces of that. But I think basically my schooling was all done in Milwaukee. And where was that at? At what school? I was... Um, I, th I went to View School on the south side, and uh, where we lived on 6th and Bruce, it was all Indian people that would live there. We had the first apartment, and then next door to us was Myron Skinner and Lucy. They lived next door to us, and uh, the Red Hales, that was uh, Lucy's da daughter, and the Websters, they were from uh, Bad River. You know, so it was like a big apartment building, but there was all Indian families that lived there. It was, so it was kind of, it was kind of nice growing up there. Um, and uh, then I went, I went to um, 
South Division for a while, and then I went to Amherst High School up in uh, Amherst, Wisconsin. Yeah. And that's outside of Milwaukee? That's outside of Stevens Point. Oh, Stevens Point. Mm -hmm. How did you get up there? Well, my dad, just before he retired, um, in 19, um, I think it was 1956, he bought some 80 acres of land up in um, uh, Stevens Point, right outside of Stevens Point, and um, had a lot of woods on there. My dad liked to hunt, you know. So it had 40 acres of woods and 40 acres of clear land. So he kind of went into farming a little, you know, bought an old tractor. And he would go back to Milwaukee on weekends and drive home every Friday night. Well, uh, my brothers were, one was married. My, everybody was gone. There was just me and my mother and my two little sisters and um, left at home. My brother uh, Dewey was in the uh, service and when my, my dad bought this land. And so um, I was like the man of the house when my dad was gone, you know, I had to, he showed me how to use a gun in case something happened, you know, and I had to, you know, you know, if a critter came around or something, I'd have to shoot it or, you know, taught me how to drive the car to the, in case something happened, and, you know, so. <laughs> I was about 16 years old, so I, had to do all that. So you were up there in uh, yeah. high school? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you finished there about what you No, did? no. I quit in my um, um, I quit in my senior year. Uh, I fell in love and got married, you know. I just... Uh, um, what, year, what year was that? Uh, 57. And um, married uh, Richard Elm at that time. That was my first husband, and uh, I had three children with him. And, uh, and uh, their names? Uh, Robin Rice and Richard Elm and uh, Renee Elm. Okay. And uh, that lasted only about ten years. And, but um, I, um, um, when I was getting divorced, I asked my dad, you know. Uh, Geez, what am I going to do? You know, I got these three kids to take care of. You know, I didn't listen to him the first time. He told me not to, you know, run off and get married. But I, you know, I thought I knew everything. Like kids do, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I was, you know, my heart was leading the way, not my head. And um, he told me, he said, um, go to school and become a machinist. He said, you won't have to worry, you know. So I went to MATC and took a machinist course and became a journeyman and I got a job out at Briggs and Stratton and I ended up being an external grinder and uh, then I did precision grinding for a while and uh, I ended up working there for about 10 years but um, I made good money and I was able to support my family you know um, then I went into the tavern business and um, I needed something where I'm going to be home with my kids and yet um, be able to support us, you know. So I ended up, um, well, I, I remarried and I had um, um, bought the, this tavern and uh, ended up being in tavern business for about 18 years. Um, but uh, it supported as well, you know, and my, put my, you know, my oldest girl through college. My, my uh, son didn't want to go to college. He wanted to... Um, um, joined the Marines, so he ended up joining the Marines, and um, now he's an iron worker. He's working in New York. And what was the name of your tavern? It was called the Arrow Inn, and then uh, Marlene's Bar. That was down on the South Side. Mm-hmm. And then um, none of my kids really liked the tavern business. I mean, you know, they everybody thinks it's just standing behind the bar, looking nice, you know, and smiling at the customers, but you know. Behind the scenes, it's a lot of hard work, you know, and, uh, you know, kids didn't like that, you know, because we had to give up a lot of our life, you know, because you, you basically you got to be there on weekends, you know. I tried to take off in the summers, you know, and take, you know. Um, but then in between, I was um, still taking, you know, I now I'm taking college classes, you know, I started, you know. Uh, I got my GED and then I went and started, you know, taking college courses and um, I opened up a gift shop at the airport in Milwaukee. 
um, I used to sell Indian um, beadwork and things in my tavern all the time, and my daughters did a lot of beadwork, and so finally I, you know, nobody liked the tavern business, so I opened the gift shop up in the airport in Milwaukee. Um, I opened that 16 years ago. And, uh, but I still was doing a lot of different things in Milwaukee, like um, after my father passed away in 1969, I, um, my mother came to live with me, and um, she always was, you know, uh, lonesome for other Indian elders, you know, to talk with and that, so I went around to some of the agencies and asked them if um, they would help me start an, um, a food program, and they said, you know, well, we'd like to, but there's nothing in the budget, so I ended up... Um, starting a program by myself and I got, at that time Bill Kelly was running what they call the Action Group in, in Milwaukee and he had a bunch of offices and he had a big conference room so um, that's where I had my first meal. I uh, did all the food at home and then I took it and just warmed it up in his offices, you know, in slow cookers and, and roasting pans and I had 15 elders at my first uh, dinner and I had gotten some of the people, you know, in the different offices to volunteer to go pick them up and bring them over. And that's how uh, the Indian Elderly uh, Project started in Milwaukee. You know, it was because of my mother. She um, wanted uh, other company. Well, that first time was so successful. I was only going to do that once a month. Then they said, can we do this again next week? So I ended up um, cooking again the following week. And this time we had like 20 people, and um, the third week I think photographers heard about what was going on, and they came down, and and that was the day. Just happened to be the day I was frying fry bread in a frying pan in one of the offices, you know. And I guess they said, "Well, you can't do that." <laughs> yeah, so um, I got uh, United Indians said that I could use their their place and. By this time now we have about 40 elders coming and I'm getting more and more people to volunteer and help me do this and um, especially my kids. Uh, they would end up peeling 50 pounds of potatoes and doing all kinds of things for me but you know all my projects but you know I think it made them stronger people too. Well, let me see once, where were we now? Kids were feeling 50 pounds potatoes. 50 pounds oh, potatoes. yeah, that's when we started yeah, that elderly Indian program. Elderly yeah. Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's... Uh, that, that was what year now? That was in 1978, mm -hmm. I, I think I started that. Were you, you were out mm -hmm. of the tavern then? No, no, I was still in the tavern. You are still in the mm -hmm. tavern. Are you running at the same time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, um, um, well, it got so successful. You know, we, we even started having bingo and... Uh, I was uh, calling all different organizations, and uh, I can remember our first Christmas. I have a friend that had a, a was a was in produce down there, and I asked him. I said, "You know what? I have about a hundred elders coming for our Christmas program. This was our first Christmas, and I said, uh, do you think you could, you know, give me some fruit for you know a hundred people?' And uh, he said, "You know what? I sure can.' He said, "You know, uh, I think what you're doing is really great for the, you know." He says, um, you see all the time on television, you know, for the black people and the Hispanics and that, but you never see anybody doing anything for the Indians. He said, yeah, I'm really happy to, to do something. So we went, um, and he said, come back on, you know, the, the day that you're having this. And I told him what day we're going to be there, and he said, and uh, pick it up. So we went, and here he had um, little baskets, or like boxes, and in he had them uh, all decorated, and there was um, apples and oranges and pears and a banana and, and you know, all kinds of things, nice sprinkles on them, you know, like candies and nuts and everything. He had 100 boxes for us, and I just started to cry because, you know, you know I mean, that was a lot of money for somebody to donate, you know, sure. to, you know, to just give us, so. And um, we had uh, one of the Indian guys uh, play Santa Claus in... Um, uh, I mean, it was, uh, you know, that's probably one of my nicest memories, thinking, because a lot of those people are gone now, but, um, 
That was a big job. Excuse me, yeah, that was nice. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that was, and that program is still ongoing right now. It is. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's still going pretty good. As a matter of fact, they're, um, 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 they're building a new place. They're building something nice now. Uh, you moved uh, that one on, and then you had your airport business, mm -hmm. and then you closed that down. No, I still have my airport we business. Still have it. Yeah, I don't know how long it'll last after September 11th. Uh, business has been going downhill really uh, steady, but I still go to Milwaukee once a week. Um, but you moved up here. I, and I work 90... for the Census Bureau also. <laughs> oh, I uh, started, I started, well, I always, I've always been involved in different, in the com Indian community in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. I started um, a group that was just, um, it was called uh, Careers for Young Indian Women. Um, it was geared basically for all the reservations. But I told them there was such a need for something like that in Milwaukee. So uh, this was uh, from out of Great Lakes um, Intertribal. Intertribal, yeah. And so they let me bring the program into Milwaukee. And it was geared for uh, girls from 8 to 18. And um, we taught them, um, you know, you can do anything you want to do in life. You can be any kind of career. So whatever kind of... Uh, uh, of uh, uh, field the girls wanted to go into, I would try to get an Indian person. Like uh, one girl wanted to go into nursing, and I knew that uh, uh, Mona uh, Mona John was a nurse at that time in Milwaukee, so she came in and talked to the girls. Um, we had a girl that wanted to be a truck driver. I found an Indian uh, woman that was a truck driver, brought her in. Um, we had. Uh, a beautician come in. You know, we had uh, a doctor, a woman doctor, Indian woman that was a doctor come in, and an Indian man that was a doctor come in and talk to the girls about medicine. We took them to Planned Parenthood. We took them to, um, um, we had people come in and, you know, uh, teach them how to do a good grooming. Uh, we had people that came in and did uh, nutrition things with the kids and uh, uh, we also tried to get them to be, um, you know, not, uh, to open up a little bit, I guess, you know, to kind of, you know, um, Indian girls, you know, they don't like to to talk a lot, but uh, uh, we um, got them together with other Indian girls. We brought them up to, on a trip to the reservation. So it was kind of nice because a lot of the kids didn't even know what a reservation was, even though they were Indians, you know. They'd never been to a reservation, so. And that was a good program that we brought in. Um, also, it was on several boards in Milwaukee. And um, Have you been uh, involved in anything since you moved back here? The only thing I did when I was up here is uh, they know that I work for the Census Bureau, so um, they were doing an elderly survey. And so uh, Marge uh, Stevens asked me to come in and um, look over their survey. And I looked it over, and then she asked me if I wanted to go out and help them do some interviewing of the elders. And I did that, and that was uh, four or five years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. What about uh, uh, recreation or uh, you know, uh, committees or... Commissions? Have you been involved in any of that around? No, um, I kind of been. Uh, 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 there was just one I wanted to get onto at one time, and that was the land land committee. I was kind of interested in getting on that, but um, uh, I haven't pursued it. You know, I haven't. You know, but I'm kind of interested in you know um, the land committee. And Have you had any opportunity to? Uh, uh, Know, frequent the casino and the bingo. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I have the, every opportunity. <laughs> every opportunity I get, I go. <laughs> I see. I see. What's what's your uh, what's your position or your observation in reference to the uh, uh, the, the flow of the tribe and 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 uh, and it, you know its growth uh, and the uh, per capita payment situation. Well, let me tell you, I that? think that gaming is probably the best thing that's ever happened to this tribe. 
And I say that because I know um, just by looking around me, you know, uh, look at the health center, the turtle school, uh, the new homes that are up here, um, the cars, the way people are walking around. You don't see as much alcoholism as you did before. Um, I don't anyway. You know, I think people are frowning on that again. Uh, people are holding their heads up high. They don't, you know, years ago only the men were working and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, my dad didn't even want to bring us back here because, of the, you know, he thought that uh, there was too much drinking, you know. And, um, but if he could see this, I think he would be very happy that, you know, just to see, you know, what gaming has brought, you know, as far as education, the money is going, I think, to a good cause. Um, I don't think we would have this quality of life. You wouldn't be sitting here with the money to tape this if we if it wasn't for gaming. There's a lot of things that um, you know um, gaming has done to benefit the United people, and I think um, uh, health-wise, education, those are the two um, things that I think we should push. You know, on our children, make sure that um, you know we give them the best education because. Let's face it, we live in a white man's world and the only way to, you know, it, meet progress is, is, is to keep, you know, keep up with education and make sure that our children are educated. So I think gaming is good. And I try to support my tribe. You know, what do you feel about the uh, per capita payment? Um, I'm happy with it. I don't know. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, it's enough to, you know, I, I mean, uh, I would rather see the money, you know, like I said, it's going into um, the different programs and, and uh, things and for education. And if that's where the money has to go, I, would, I wouldn't care if we didn't get no per capita as long as it went to, you know, to benefit, you know, the majority of the tribe. I don't care. You know. If it's going to mean a betterment of our life, that's fine. That's you know, for that little money that we get, it doesn't make any difference to me, you know. Is there areas that uh, you'd like to, you know, you'd like to make some comments on and, be, you know, on, with the understanding that hopefully our children will be looking at these videos at some point in time in the future? Well, the only thing that I want to stress is that um, um, the way we were raised, we were raised with so much respect for our parents and our elders. And um, I try to raise my children the same way, to have that same respect. And um, I think it all has to do with, um, um, with parenting. And uh, my children came from a broken home because I was divorced. And my mother and father were married for you know, forever it seems like before my father died, you know, I mean, 50 years. And, um, but I think that it's so important that if we could have some kind of programs teaching our children, you know, about parenting and marriage. And I think that all comes with education. And I think that should be something that's taught from little on and, um, and just to make sure that our kids have that, you know, two parent homes. I mean, we should do something on the reservation to forbid divorce or whatever, you know, to, to make sure that these kids don't, you know, they, you know, I don't care what anybody says. Children have to have a, a mother and a father, and that's the way, you know, Indian life always was, you know, and um, that's the way it should be. You know, I'm, I'm all for, you know, um, uh, Yes, I, I'm. I I just don't like to see the broken homes. You know, I think it's just too easy for us to get out of it. You know, just like you don't like those shoes, real mom, get another pair. You know, that's just the way we we're taking marriage now. You know, and it shouldn't be that way. Okay. Well, I want to thank you. I, I thank you for coming down and uh, yeah. 